Good morning, um, and thank you for joining us this morning for Friendship Grand Rounds. If you're an Emory University or healthcare employee and would like to receive a CME credit hour for attending today, login information can be found in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen. If you have any issues with this webinar, um, please uh, send Julie Hawkins an email or drop a note via the chat feature. This morning, we're pleased to welcome Dr. John Strickler. Dr. Strickler is an associate professor at Duke University, where he's the associate director of clinical research, GI oncology, and co-leader of the Molecular Tumor Board. He received his bachelor's from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and his medical degree from the University of Chicago, Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He completed his residency in internal medicine at the University of Washington and fellowship in Hemong and Ong at Duke University. Dr. Strickler spe uh, specializes in the treatment of GI cancers. His research focuses on precision cancer medicine, identify, identification of genomic biomarkers that predict sensitivity or resistance to targeted therapies and immunotherapy. He has a particular interest in non-invasive liquid biopsies to, to deliver on the promise of precision cancer medicine. He's the PI on several national multi-site um, investigator-sponsored trials, including a study called Colomate, looking at liquid biopsies to match um, patients with targeted therapy in colorectal cancer, and the Mountaineer trial, which investigates HER2-directed therapy for metastatic colorectal cancer patients. Naturally, he is the co-chair of the GI steering committee for ACRU, and he's a member of the ASCO treatment guideline committees for advanced colon cancer. Welcome, Dr. Strickler. Thanks so much, Christina. It's uh, a pleasure to uh, join you all today, at least virtually. I was hoping we could do this in person, but uh, unfortunately, uh, reality intervened and uh, we're continuing to do this virtually. Um, want to uh, thank you all for inviting me. As, as you said, I'm Dr. Strickler from uh, Duke University. And, um, you know, it's the, the campus is beautiful right now. The students are all back and, uh, you know, I know it's it's an exciting time and um, one day we'll all get together again in person. So um, yeah, precision medicine is predicated on the notion that therapeutic strategies can be tailored to a tumor's unique molecular profile. So, you know, uh, our, our thoracic colleagues have led the way in showing us that we can identify drugs that are not toxic and beneficial to our patients. And that's really what we've been moving towards for many years now. Uh, colorectal cancer world has been a bit slower than the uh, world of lung cancer, but we are slowly catching up to our lung colleagues in terms of finding um, active targeted therapies. So, you know, essentially what we're talking about is um, a, a revolutionary model of drug development. In the old days, uh, which were not that long ago, um, we would take an intervention, randomize patients to uh, arm A or arm B and squint our eyes to look at the difference on the Kaplan-Meier curves. And, uh, and then, you know, we'd have an approved therapy. Now in this personalized medicine model, we've got a group of patients perform a molecular analysis and uh, we're seeing patients assigned to treatments with uh, no control arms. And that's leading to FDA approvals off of sometimes very small patient numbers. So this is a whole new model, and I think it's because of this um, significant effect size that we're seeing such a, a difference in our uh, paradigm of drug development. So when I completed um, my oncology fellowship in 2011, um, there was really only one biomarker we needed to know to treat colon cancer, and that was uh, KRAS status. Um, patients who had a KRAS mutation were not candidates for anti-EGFR therapies. Fast forward 10 years later, I feel sorry for the fellows um, coming out of training. They have to learn a lot more targets. And this is um, now uh, what we have for actionable colorectal cancer targets now. Um, this is exciting. Um, it's, it gives us a lot of opportunities to treat patients with therapies other than uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy, but it's also a burden both on our trainees and then also on our uh, community oncologists who have to keep up with all this. Um, but I think the biggest challenge is one of resistance. And this is something that we all face in the oncology world, whether we are gastrointestinal oncologists or thoracic oncologists or um, in any other discipline. And when we're talking about resistance, um, you know, primary resistance, you know, speaks to uh, you know, progression essentially on first 
uh, restaging as shown here in this uh, picture of these liver metastases that worsened. And then secondary resistance is um, also a common problem where patients may have an initial response to treatment and then rapid outgrowth, in this case, 18 months later of worsening metastatic disease. So um, this has been an area of focus for me and, and my research, and um, this is going to be the, the focus of our discussion today, is talking about mechanisms both of primary and secondary resistance specific to the world of colorectal cancer. Now, when I talk about potential mechanisms of acquired resistance, uh, there are a number of different uh, ways a tumor develops resistance to therapy. One is uh, the emergence of secondary uh, resistance mutations and amplifications. We've seen feedback reactivation of onco oncogenic pathways, loss of target expression, histologic transformation, and then this concept called adaptive mutability, um, which I'll go into briefly. But really the focus of my discussion today will be um, showing you all what we've learned in terms of the emergence of secondary resistance mutations and amplifications to drive resistance. Now, um, one of the core problems that we have in colorectal cancer, and I think what makes our world a little bit more challenging than say um, the world of thoracic oncology is that uh, colorectal cancer is plagued with heterogeneity. And when we talk about heterogeneity of resistance, we could uh, see interlesional heterogeneity, which describes uh, differences uh, between distinct metastatic lesions, and then, um, which often is the case in colorectal cancer, intralesional heterogeneity, and that is different mutations and alterations emerging within the same uh, tumor lesion. And, and um, this plagues our field and has made it very challenging to develop targeted therapies over the past decade. So uh, one of the things we've learned is that a single needle biopsy may vastly underrepresent uh, molecular heterogeneity and um, we found, at least in our world of colorectal cancer, that these uh, circulating tumor DNA, the so-called liquid biopsy, uh, is in many cases um, a better tool for us to identify the extent of this heterogeneity. So with that background, um, here are the objectives of this talk. Um, what I'm gonna present to you today is um, biomarkers of resistance to EGFR, BRAF, and HER2 inhibitors in metastatic colorectal cancer. I'll discuss some of the drivers of primary or de novo resistance, also show you secondary resistance, and then some therapeutic strategies that we are developing to overcome resistance. And I will point out that um, Emory has been a significant partner in developing these uh, therapeutic strategies to overcome resistance. So let's start first with EGFR. And I, I want to, um, I recognize that many of you um, are not uh, gastrointestinal med medical oncologists, so I will uh, give uh, a background here. Um, the epidermal growth factor receptor, EGFR, is a member of the uh, ERBB receptor tyrosine kinase superfamily. EGFR activates uh, multiple downstream signaling cascades, including the MAP kinase pathway, and activation of these pathways promotes adhesion, angiogenesis, proliferation, survival, um, uh, and, and other mechanisms of tumor genesis. So anti-EGFR antibodies, which are um, heavily used in the GI medical oncology world, these bind the extracellular domain of EGFR and prevent ligand binding. The two anti-EGFR antibodies that we commonly use and that are FDA approved include cetuximab and panitumumab. I will point out that in my geography, we have a very high uh, grade four reaction rate to cetuximab. So you'll hear us uh, up in this, um, in this latitude in North Carolina and Tennessee, we will predominantly use panitumumab, but nationally cetuximab is used quite frequently. Um, these molecules have been tested head to head and are and, and have equivalent efficacy. So primary resistance occurs typically due to one of two mechanisms. The first is an alteration in the MAP kinase signaling pathway as shown on this slide. These, these mutations maintain MAP kinase pathway signaling even after upstream inhibition of the pathway by an EGFR antibody. 
The second mechanism that we see commonly is amplification of a receptor tyrosine kinase. Um, amplification of these receptors like MET and ERBB2 can either sustain activation of the MET kinase pathway or potentially activate alternate signaling pathways. Um, in the following slides, I will show you some of the clinical evidence that we have supporting these biomarkers of resistance. And I'll start with uh, the most straightforward one and one that is highly likely to show up on a, a board exam or a board recertification exam, and that's KRAS, uh, NRAS, uh, and BRAF. So um, the most common RAS mutations occur in exons, in exon 2, codons 12 and 13. Uh, of KRAS, and um, these are well-established drivers of EGFR antibody resistance. In this study of the EGFR antibody cetuximab versus best supportive care, cetuximab was associated with improved survival um, among patients with KRAS wild-type tumors, but not among those with KRAS mutated tumors. And these findings have been replicated in multiple subsequent studies, both for cetuximab and panitumab. Um, in addition to KRAS exon 2, which occur in approximately 40% of patients with colorectal cancer, mutations in exons 3 and 4, um, and NRAS exons 2, 3, and 4, the so called extended RAS mutations, um, occur in another 10 to 20% of patients. And these mutations have uh, shown the ability uh, to induce primary resistance to cetuximab and penetumab. And um, in a prospective retrospective analysis of the phase three prime study as shown here on this slide, this compared full fox panitumab versus full fox alone. Um, investigators found, this was many years ago, that both KRAS exon two mutations and extended RAS mutations were associated with inferior survival um, with panitumab full fox as opposed to full fox alone. So if you were to ever see this on your board exam, definitely do not give a patient uh, with a RAS mutation um, in anti-EGFR therapy. And, and this is um, a summary of both the PRIME study, which looked at full fox PMAB versus full fox in the CRYSTAL trial, which looked at full furies tux versus full furies um, placebo. And uh, the key point here is in red, which is that patients with RAS mutations do not benefit from anti-EGFR therapy. And in fact, in the PRIME study, I'll just use the pointer here for a moment, you can see people actually had inferior survival um, if they had a RAS mutation and they were given an anti-EGFR in addition to full FOX. Um, so um, although the data is less robust, uh, BRAF V600E mutations also appear to confer resistance to anti-EGFR therapies. This is a meta-analysis um, which was needed because these alterations are relatively rare. But in this meta-analysis, survival with anti-EGFR therapy was no better than supportive care in patients with BRAF V600E mutated metastatic colorectal cancer. And later in this discussion, I will share some novel therapeutic strategies to target these BRAF V600E mutations. Um, so, this is now the world is getting complicated. I've shown you kind of well-established knowledge from the, from the geo-oncology world, um, but with the widespread use of clinical NGS testing, increasingly clinicians are identifying a wide array of BRAF mutations. And BRAF mutations can be classified into three groups um, based on their biochemical properties. Class one mutants, which are the classic BRAF V600 mutations, exhibit high kinase activity and signal as RAS independent monomers. Class two mutants are activating and signal as RAS independent dimers. And class three mutants have impaired kinase activity and you'll hear them uh, referred to as kinase dead alterations. And these class three mutants depend on RAS to activate signaling. So given that class two BRAF mutations activate MAP kinase signaling of EGFR, these are thought to be refractory to anti-EGFR antibody treatment, similar to class one uh, BRAF V600E mutations. But in contrast, the class three group may depend on upstream activity. So uh, they, this is a group of mutations where there could still be a role for anti-EGFR therapies. 
So a multi-center pooled analysis, and this came out of Memorial Sloan Kettering, um, confirmed these preclinical predictions that class two mutations drive resistance to anti-GFR therapy and class three mutations in many cases are still sensitive. And in this very small underpowered study of 25 patients, uh, they found that patients with class three mutant metastatic colorectal cancer had a numerically greater PFS with anti-GFR therapy though this study was uh, underpowered to, to uh, detect a statistically significant difference. But it does suggest that these class three mutations may still be sensitive to an anti-EGFR therapy. And, and um, I will point out that um, the accrued network of which I'm involved and Christina Wu is involved will be launching a trial soon to target this group of patients with class three BRAF mutations with a uh, anti-BRAF MEK anti-GFR triplet. So um, beyond the MAP kinase pathway, receptor tyrosine kinase amplifications have been associated with EGFR resistance. Um, Preclinical models have suggested that both MET amplification and HER2 amplification drive anti-EGFR resistance. I want to now focus on what we know about HER2 amplification. Um, since Emory has been a big partner with us on uh, targeting this in colorectal cancer. So HER2 amplification is rare. It occurs in uh, 2 to 3% of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer. Um, although this is a lower rate than, say, um, esophageal or esophagogastric cancer and gallbladder cancer, um, in absolute terms, this is still a pretty sizable number of patients, 1,500 patients in the U.S., and that's due to the higher prevalence of colorectal cancer overall. One of the things we've learned is that uh, when you enrich for certain types of patients, you can find much higher rates of HER2 amplification. The Heracles study looked at a group of uh, nearly 1,000 patients with KRAS exon 2 wild type metastatic colorectal cancer and found HER2 amplification in 5% of patients. MD Anderson series um, hyper enriched for RAS wild type and BRAF wild type patients and found HER2 amplification rate exceeding 12%. And then um, here at Duke, uh, we had a cell free DNA profiling initiative for patients with RAS wild type colorectal cancer. And we also found that HER2 amplification was in about 12% of patients. So in work from Italy, um, and this involved uh, taking more than 100 uh, patient-derived xenograft models. They looked at major drivers uh, of primary resistance to um, cetuximab in this case, or anti-EGFR therapy. And um, here they found that HER2 amplification was strongly associated with primary resistance to cetuximab. They were also able to identify another small group of patients with MET amplification and also found that that drove primary resistance in this model. Then there's been several clinical studies that have looked at whether HER2 amplification drives anti-EGFR resistance, and the results are, are, are generally all converging around um, the finding that yes, they do drive resistance. This was a, a study published in 2013 um, out of Europe where they looked at 170 patients with KRAS wild type colorectal cancer and looked at uh, responsiveness to anti-EGFR therapy and found that those patients, as shown here in blue, um, who had HER2 amplification had much worse both progression-free survival and OS when receiving an anti-EGFR therapy compared to HER2 non-amplified patients. Um, an updated analysis out of Europe looked at another, uh, this was once again another retrospective analysis of outcomes on anti-EGFR therapy in patients who were either HER2 positive or HER2 negative. I will point out that they also found that patients who are HER2 amplified were more likely to have lung metastases and a higher tumor burden. They were also more likely to have a left-sided tumor. And in their analysis, once again, they found that um, progression-free survival was numerically worse um, in those patients who are HER2 positive receiving anti-EGFR therapy. And then finally, a third analysis out of the United States, this comes out of MD Anderson, also looked at a group of patients who were HER2 positive compared to uh, HER2 negative and compared PFS on anti-EGFR therapy. And once again, a pretty significant difference 
HER2 uh, positive patients had a PFS of 2.8 months, and that was 8.1 months in patients who were HER2 negative. Now, one criticism you could have of this type of analysis is that it's confounded by the prognostic impact of HER2 um, amplified uh, disease. So the same uh, group from MD Anderson, uh, Dr. Rogoff went back and looked at how the same group of patients did on first line therapy and found that uh, what on first line therapy, there was no significant difference between HER2 positive and HER2 negative patients, suggesting that there is no prognostic impact of um, HER2 as a biomarker, that this is really a driver of um, anti-EGFR resistance. So um, based on that work, um, this, there is a large national study looking at whether HER2 drives primary resistance to anti-EGFR therapy. This is the SWOG 1613 study, which is randomizing patients uh, who are in the second line setting and beyond to either cetuximab and irinotecan or trastuzumab, pertuzumab, and anti-HER2 combination. And uh, this study is ongoing, though I, I think they have struggled with enrollment nationally due to the wide availability of anti-HER2 therapies, making it difficult to randomize patients away to a therapy that's um, not likely to be uh, beneficial to, to many patients. So I'm not sure if this study will ever complete enrollment. I hope it does because that would be the definitive study to show us whether um, anti, uh, sorry, whether um, HER2 positivity drives resistance uh, to anti-EGFR therapies. So I wanted to move now to mechanisms of secondary resistance to EGFR inhibition, which is a particular interest of mine and my research. So, um, Nearly all, all patients who experience benefit with EGFR monoclonal antibodies eventually experience disease progression. And circulating tumor DNA has uh, provided us insights into mechanisms of acquired resistance, particularly where there's tumor heterogeneity present, and that's a particular strength of circulating tumor DNA. There are three main categories of acquired resistance. Um, to anti-EGFR therapies in patients with colorectal cancer. The first involves MAP kinase pathway alterations. The second is receptor tyrosine kinase amplifications. And then the third is something called EGFR active domain mutations. And I will go into a little bit more detail about that. So, um, so with few exceptions, <clears throat> the genetic mechanisms for primary and secondary resistance are overlapping. And um, in this figure, and I apologize, it's so small, the red text highlights the most frequent acquired mutations driving anti-EGFR resistance. So blood-based uh, molecular profiling of cell-free DNA reveals KRAS and NRAS mutations as by far uh, the most common uh, mechanism of acquired resistance to anti-EGFR therapy. In addition to RAS mutations, we see acquired BRAF mutations, which are often detected in blood, and these can be either class one or class two mutations that we see commonly. Um, and these BRAF mutations are thought to drive resistance as well. And then there are additional genomic alterations associated with EGFR resistance, including the amplification of ERBB2 or HER2, KRAS, and MET. Um, and as I mentioned, another common mechanism is the so-called EGFR ectodomain mutation. Um, these mutations prevent EGFR antibody binding and um, allow EGFR-mediated signaling to continue. And this is actually one of the more common resistance mechanisms as well. But interestingly, this is associated with a more favorable prognosis compared to the acquired RAS mutations. So um, in work that we did here at Duke, Dr. Karen Gia and I analyzed cell-free DNA from 69 patients who had progressed on anti-EGFR therapy. And in this work, we used the GARDEN360 assay. We then compared um, the mutational landscape of this cohort against a larger um, cohort from uh, GARDEN Health Database. And in this analysis, we found that EGFR mutations, and in particular, the EGFR ectodomain mutations were highly enriched in patients with this, in this uh, EGFR refractory cohort. 
And as I mentioned, amplifications and receptor tyrosine kinase are also detected in blood, um, more commonly at progression on anti-EGFR therapies. And, uh, and uh, these are capable of driving MAP kinase signaling or PI3 kinase signaling, and in some cases, went beta catenin pathways. Um, and uh, Dr. Gia and I also looked at uh, the prevalence of various amplifications in this EGFR antibody refractory population and found that MED amplification and ERBB2 amplification were highly enriched. Now, I will say with respect to ERBB2, many of these patients had the ERBB2 amplification present in primary tissue. Sometimes it wasn't even known about. And in some cases, these were acquired um, as a driver of secondary resistance. So, um, Although some acquired mutations are therapeutically targetable, um, cell-free DNA profiling reveals the limit of uh, drug therapy and overcoming EGFR resistance. So uh, in this analysis, uh, my colleagues, Ryan Corker and Scott Kopetz and myself, looked at the cell-free DNA profile results from nearly 1,400 patients um, with metastatic colorectal cancer. Once again, this comes out of the Garden Health database. Of these, uh, 42 patients were known to have failed uh, prior anti-EGFR therapy, and each row here represents an individual patient. And, and I think what this figure highlights is this concept of heterogeneity of resistance. So in, in most cases here, there was more than one acquired resistance mutation. And in this top row, uh, row number one, um, this uh, poor soul here had 13 different um, simultaneous resistance mutations detected. And um, this presents a real challenge for us in terms of targeting resistance. I, I look at my colleagues in thoracic oncology and typically um, they don't have the same degree of heterogeneity of resistance. And I think um, that's one of the reasons why it's been such a challenge for us in the colorectal world designing targeted therapies because we see this rapid out outgrowth of multiple um, independent resistance mutations, many of which are not therapeutically targetable. Um, but cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA also points out some potential therapeutic opportunities. So this is the redemptive story for us in the GI oncology world. Um, this is a single patient example of a patient who was treated with cetuximab and irinotecan as shown here in this timeline. Here's a uh, baseline. The patient um, had good response as shown with these gray bars on this combination. But what you see emerge in blood are these KRAS G13D, uh, this KRAS G13D mutation. And eventually the patient developed acquired resistance. Now the anti-EGFR therapy was stopped. And interestingly, that resistance mutation no longer had a selective advantage. Uh, so when the anti-EGFR therapy was withdrawn, we see that the KRAS mutation went away. The patient here was then rechallenged with the alternative anti-EGFR therapy and got some therapeutic benefit. But then what you see emerge are two independent KRAS mutations, the KRAS G12V and G13D. So this highlights both um, you know, mechanisms of resistance and then also um, shows some potential therapeutic opportunities, particularly if this anti-EGFR therapy um, is uh, stopped and um, held for a few months. And uh, in further work by uh, the MD Anderson team, um, this further supports the notion that these RAS and EGFR ecta domain mutations decay after withdrawal of anti-EGFR therapy. In this retrospective cohort of 135 uh, RAS-well type patients who had progressed on anti-EGFR therapy. Uh, we see the emergence of RAS and EGFR mutations, but the decay half-life when you stop the anti-EGFR therapy is about three and a half months for a RAS allele and 6.9 months for an EGFR allele. So this suggests that if you do um, have acquired resistance, that the best strategy is to stop the anti-EGFR therapy and then potentially rechallenge the patient later on. And um, there have been a number of groups that have looked at this EGFR rechallenge concept. This was um, work done out of Italy, where they took a group of patients with metastatic colorectal cancer that was RAS wild type, 
treated them with first line chemotherapy and anti EGFR therapy, as shown here. Um, patients stayed on for more than six months. They had at least a partial response. At progression, they then um, treated with a non anti EGFR regimen. So, in this case, Fulfox and Bevacizumab in most cases. And then all of these patients were rechallenged with irinotecan and cetuximab. And um, so, oh, I, I've got a, a, a freeze, frozen uh, slide here. It'll, it'll come out in a second here. Um, there, there we go, I'll take away the pointer. So the investigators here showed a response rate of 21% and all the confirmed responses as shown here on the slide occurred in patients who were RAS wild type in blood at the time of rechallenge. So what they found is that if there was a RAS mutation detected in blood, nearly all of those patients failed to benefit. Uh, but if the RAS mutation was not present, uh, those patients did benefit. And they went back and looked at both progression-free survival and overall survival, and once again showed that those patients who are RAS wild type in blood did significantly better, both in respect to progression-free survival and overall survival. Um, and that led to an updated uh, study, the Kronos trial, which was presented this year at ASCO, um, where they selected patients based on cell-free DNA results. Um, patients who are RAS, BRAF, and EGFR wild type in blood were rechallenged with panitumumab, and um, that excluded about a third of patients from rechallenge, as shown here on this slide. And once again, they were able to show impressive results for an EGFR rechallenge strategy, in this case, 30%. Um, response rate, uh, which in a refractory colorectal setting is a very strong response rate. Um, and this was based on kind of hyper selection of patients who were RAS, uh, BRAF, and EGFR wild type at the time of rechallenge. Um, they also showed um, on the left that some responses were quite durable. And in the Kaplan Meyer curve on the right, the median PFS was approximately four months. Now, um, that in the world of colorectal cancer is impressive results in this refractory setting where the current standard of care has a response rate of about 2% and PFS of two months for our FDA approved therapies. So um, the lessons learned from this are, we have learned several lessons about EGFR rechallenge. The first is that rechallenge is most likely to benefit patients who benefited in the past and that EGFR and RAS subclones emerge under selective pressure, but that these also decay to low levels over time, and that's usually the optimal time to rechallenge a patient. Um, and uh, we think that cell-free DNA profiling is a promising tool to prospectively identify patients who, are, who will benefit from EGFR antibody rechallenge. Now, um, this gets into some of the work we're doing together, Christina Wu and I, um, have developed this strategy. We actually wrote this trial about five years ago, um, but it has taken a long time to launch. This is the PULSE trial, uh, which I believe is open at Emory as well. Um, this takes a group of patients with uh, RAS wild type metastatic colorectal cancer who've progressed on prior anti-EGFR therapy. We then uh, perform cell-free DNA profiling using the GARDEN360 a test, and then if the patient has the absence of resistance alterations, is randomized to either panitumab rechallenge or standard of care. I will say that one of the major changes we'll be making is we'll be dropping the control arm, uh, mainly because it's been very difficult to randomize patients away from EGFR rechallenge to standard of care treatment. Um, you know, I, I joke around that it's un-American to be randomized to standard of care. Um, patients want to be on the EGFR rechallenge arm. Um, so I suspect that change will be coming through fairly soon. Um, uh, and until now, I've focused on uh, emergent genomic alterations as key drivers of acquired resistance. Um, but these acquired alterations don't account for all mechanisms of resistance. And some recent work published um, a couple of years ago have suggested there are other mechanisms at work uh, one mechanism is this concept of adaptive mutability. And in these cell line experiments, colorectal cancer cells were treated with cetuximab on the left uh, or the BRAF inhibitor dabrafenib on the right. 
And in both examples, these targeted therapies um, cause downregulation of mismatch repair and homologous recombination DNA repair genes and upregulation of error prone polymerases. And um, this suggested that this, there are other mechanisms of resistance at work. Um, and and these, in this case, these mechanisms lead to increased tumor mutability. And um, so this just highlights that there are still things we don't know about how resistance emerges. And this suggests that there may be other mechanisms uh, that are worth studying in the future. So with that, I will uh, move on to BRAF as a target in colorectal cancer. Uh, first, some background. Uh, BRAF mutations are seen in about five to 8% of patients with metastatic colon cancer. These tumors are often right-sided, high-grade, um, associated with very poor prognosis, and as I showed you earlier, limited benefit from anti-EGFR therapy. Um, response to anti-BRAF targeted therapy is poor in colon cancer as opposed to melanoma. Um, there are um, several reasons for this. What's thought to be the major driver is that there is high expression of the, the uh, EGFR on colon cancer cells where there's not a melanoma. Um, and BRAF inhibitors in colon cancer relieve feedback inhibition of, um, of RAS and lead to induction of BRAF V600E in wild type dimers, as shown here in this figure. And that leads to sustained uh, ERK activation, as shown here. So um, improved efficacy is observed with uh, RAF inhibitors combined with either EGFR or MEK inhibitors, as shown here in this figure. Um, results from the Beacon trial, which were published in the New England Journal and updated last year at ASCO, show activity for the combination of a BRAF inhibitor and carafenib together with cetuximab, um, both with and without the uh, MEK inhibitor benimatinib. And based on these results, the current standard of care for a BRAF V600E mutant colorectal cancer is the combination of encarafenib and cetuximab. But uh, once again, um, we are plagued with rapid acquisition of resistance. As I showed you here, response rate is 20%. Um, overall survival, even with this new regimen, is only nine months. So unlike EGFR, less is known about uh, molecular drivers of resistance to anti-BRAF, EGFR, or MEK combinations. And in two separate studies, Genotyping was performed both on cell lines and patient tumors that developed acquired resistance to anti-BRAF combinations. And uh, in all of these cases, um, the mechanisms of acquired resistance converged on uh, one unifying mechanism, which is that there's activation of MAP kinase signaling and induction of RAF dimers. Um, so things like BRAF amplification, EGFR amplification, KRAS amplification, these are fairly common drivers of resistance to um, our anti-BRAF strategies. Um, and I will point out that um, BRAF dimers are insensitive to our FDA-approved BRAF monomer inhibitors, things like encarafenib and dibrafenib. Um, so um, one of my areas of interest is therapeutic added, um, strategies to overcome resistance. Um, to uh, anti-BRAF therapies. And um, some of the concepts that are being looked at include BRAF dimer inhibition. I know there are a number of uh, molecules in development. We've looked at ERK inhibition, some targeted therapy combinations, cytotoxic chemotherapy. But another accrued study that um, I suspect Emory will be um, participating in is this concept of uh, BRAF rechallenge. And this is based on the same notion that some of these acquired mutations may actually disappear um, after you withhold an anti-BRAF combination, and that those patients may be um, able to benefit from rechallenge. Um, in this case, with a uh, anti-BRAF MAC EGFR triplet. And um, I wanted to wrap up with um, and with her too. Um, as mentioned prior, HER2 drives resistance to anti-EGFR therapies. And um, we've known for some time that uh, we can give the same drugs that are, that are approved for breast cancer uh, to patients with uh, HER2 positive colon cancer and see um, 
outstanding results. This is preclinical work out of Italy showing that um, trastuzumab monotherapy and lapatinib monotherapy uh, don't have significant activity, but the combination appears to be highly active. Um, Heracles was the um, first large study that showed the activity of an anti-HER2 combination in patients with HER2 positive colon cancer. This was published about five years ago. In this study, they found a 30% response rate. Um, and they also found that higher levels of HER2 expression um, very much predicted for better response to this combination. This is not surprising. Um, seven out of eight patients who had a response had um, IHC3+. Plus. The median PFS out of Heracles was 21 weeks, and um, the, some of those responses were quite durable. Um, they also found that gene copy number was a strong predictor of benefit in their study. So in their case, they set a cutoff of 9.45 off of FISH and uh, saw that those patients with higher copy numbers did particularly well. Um, additional data came out of the My Pathway trial, which um, as a reminder was trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Um, and in a subset analysis out of this, they looked at the performance of trastuzumab and pertuzumab in patients with colon cancer and found a uh, decent response rate of 30 32%, but nearly all the responses were concentrated in patients with KRAS wild type disease, in this case, 40% response rate. Um, median PFS was only 2.9 months in the overall patient population. But when you look once again at that KRAS wild type group, we see substantially better results for an anti-HER2 combination and HER2 positive colon cancer, median PFS five months versus 1.4 months. So uh, the, the learning here is that uh, we should really only be targeting HER2 in patients who are RAS wild type, um, at least in the colon cancer population. Now, um, Dr. Wu and I have been uh, working at HER2 as a target for many years now. Um, I will point out that um, Emory is a, uh, one of our original founding sites for the Mountaineer trial, which looked at trastuzumab and tucatinib for patients with HER2 positive colorectal cancer. And in uh, results that we presented at, in Barcelona in 2019, we saw a 52% response rate and a median a PFS of eight months. This led to a registrational study, which I suspect we'll report out next year. But the key question is who benefits from an anti-HER2, a selective anti-HER2 regimen um, in, in this colorectal cancer patient population? Now my pathway study did a nice job of identifying some of these key biomarkers. I will point out that KRAS status appears to be very important for predicting responsiveness as I showed you earlier, 40% response rate for RAS wild type and HER2 positive versus 8%. PIK3CA also appears to be a significant driver of response, 43% response rate if PIK3CA wild type, 13% if mutated. Um, prior EGFR treatment does not appear to impact responsiveness um, to this anti-HER2 combo. Similarly, tumor sightedness appears to be a significant driver of responsiveness to anti-HER2 therapies. Uh, in my pathway, 35% response rate for left-sided cancers, 8% response rate on the right. We also presented this data at ESMO a couple of years ago where we saw 65% response rate, small numbers uh, granted, but 65% response rate for ticatinib and trastuzumab for left-sided primaries no responses out of only four patients for right-sided primaries. We will be uh, updating all of this data. This was an investigator-sponsored trial. Uh, the company has taken this over based on uh, this, these very favorable results, uh, but I hope to update this and show that tumor sightedness really is a driver of different outcomes uh, for ticatinib and trastuzumab. Um, Heracles also looked at um, circulating tumor DNA and uh, examined uh, whether they could identify mechanisms both of primary and acquired resistance. And this is a busy figure, so I'll try to break it down as well as I can. In um, figure A, this is a waterfall plot that shows time to progression. Figure B shows um, maximum tumor shrinkage. And in this analysis, 
um, high ERBV2 copy number and the absence of KRAS, NRAS, BRAF, and PIK3CA mutations, and that's really characterized by this group of patients, these patients clearly did the best in the Heracles trial with that lapatinib trastuzumab combo. Um, this Italian group also found that the relative uh, mutant allele frequency of KRAS and NRAS, uh, sorry, KRAS and PIK3CA had a major impact on response. So looking here at this group here that had the best response, you can see the relative clonality of these re uh, resistance mutations was very low, as opposed to this group, which had progression as best response. And you can see these, um, for example, KRAS mutations had a much higher relative clonality as compared to the driver mutations. So that's another thing that we'll be looking at uh, when we show our Mountaineer data next year. And um, copy number in tissue, as I showed you prior, appears to be a strong predictor of benefit, but plasma copy number can be, um, at least in blood, can be confounded by a few factors like tumor burden and absolute circulating tumor DNA shedding. Um, so this Italian group also normalized plasma copy number against tumor shedding and found that adjusted plasma copy number from this Garden 360 assay appeared to be a good predictor for response. So um, I've shown you a number of challenges with respect to acquired resistance to anti-HER2 therapy. Um, we are looking at a number of different ways to overcome acquired resistance to HER2 inhibition. Uh, one concept would be, say, a HER2 rechallenge idea, and that's um, clearly uh, been active in other tumor types. Uh, Multi-kinase inhibition might be active, uh, but an area of interest as well is, um, and what seems to be active is HER2 inhibition combined with some type of cytotoxic. And um, that gets us, of course, to the Destiny C or CO1 trial, which is trastuzumab direct stecan a highly active antibody drug conjugate um, against, against HER2. And uh, this is data presented at ASCO last year where they showed a 45% response rate, but they also allowed patients on that study who had failed prior anti-HER2 therapy. And interestingly, the response rate was identical whether a patient had um, never received an anti-HER2 therapy in the past or whether they had progressed on a prior anti-HER2 therapy, the response rate was the same suggesting that this cytotoxic strategy may be active uh, for patients who develop resistance to prior um, anti-HER2 therapies. Um, we will be uh, launching a trial very soon that uh, looks at a cytotoxic strategy with uh, ticatinib and trastuzumab. Here, we're looking at a refractory group of patients with colorectal cancer, and we will be combining ticatinib and trastuzumab uh, together with um, FDA-approved TAS-102 or LONSERF uh, for patients with HER2-positive disease with a resistance mutation. The primary endpoint here will be progression-free survival, and this will be opening at uh, culminate sites nationally. So um, I have uh, gone over a ton of uh, data in a very uh, rapid way, um, and I want to leave time for questions. Um, here is a summary slide uh, showing um, all the things we've talked about here. So looked at drivers of primary and secondary resistance to EGFR, BRAF, and HER2 inhibition. Um, I've put in red here therapeutic strategies that either have open trials or trials in development. Um, I will point out that Emory is, is a major partner in uh, several of these trials, um, as I've, entered, as I've uh, indicated here with the asterisk, and very appreciative for the collaborations we've had, um, and uh, looking forward to working with Emory in future on some of these trials. Um, in terms of future plans, we've clearly made uh, advancements in targeting molecular drivers of metastatic colorectal cancer, but Resistance remains a challenge for us, uh, particularly uh, because of all the heterogeneity we see in this patient population. EGFR rechallenge is a promising approach to overcome EGFR resistance, and uh, we have launched a trial to uh, answer that question. We're also looking at therapeutic strategies to overcome resistance to anti-BRAF and anti-EGFR combos in patients with BRAF E600E mutant metastatic colorectal cancer.
And then finally, HER2 is clearly actionable and there are new FDA approved therapies, hopefully soon on the horizon. But clearly the next generation of studies needs to focus on um, drivers of primary and acquired resistance. Um, I also think that we need to start turning our attention towards non-genomic drivers of resistance and uh, we will continue to need innovative clinical trials because um, while we're making progress, you can see that still outcomes are, are not great for patients with refractory colorectal cancer. Um, one of these innovative clinical trials is the so-called Colomate trial of, of which uh, Emory is a member. Um, this takes uh, patients who um, have metastatic colorectal cancer that have progressed on first and second line uh, therapy. Um, they undergo CTDNA screening. And if they're lacking resistance mutations, potentially getting penitum every challenge, uh, we have a HER2 positive cohort. Um, and as I mentioned, we have uh, a new trial on the horizon looking at um, patients who have both HER2 positivity and a resistance alteration. And then we have an open FGFR altered cohort as well. Um, and the key thing here is that um, when patients screen for this trial, we've now got enough actionable targets that about a third of patients will qualify for a companion trial. So that's very exciting um, that we have all of these um, options available to our patients. And um, this Colomate trial is um, already launched nationally at many sites, including Emory, and very appreciative for uh, the collaboration that we've had with um, Dr. Wu, Dr. Reyes, and the entire um, Emory team in terms of trying to figure out a way to improve outcomes for these patients. So uh, with that, I wanted to uh, finish with a uh, picture from uh, walking distance from my office. This is a snapshot of Duke University here at sunrise and, um, you know, would love to get together face to face one day, but uh, this is unfortunately the way we're interacting. Um, so thanks again for the invitation to speak and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Strickler. Um, if any of the panelists, uh, if any, sorry, people in the audience have any questions, use the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, I see some questions are coming up, but while we wait for a few more, just wanted to mention next week, we'll hear from Emory Zone, um, Dr. Shishri Maitel, who will be presenting collaboration, cooperation, and clinical trials. And to view all upcoming Winship Grand Round lectures, please visit the Grand Rounds page at the Winship, Winship Cancer Center website or the Winship calendar. Um, so, John, we have a couple questions. Um, the first one's from Greg Lizitsky, one of our scientists. Have you looked if there are immune signatures that co-occur with the particular resistance subclones that you've seen? Um, that's a great question, and, and I think um, that work has not been published yet, so I would love to see that, um, that type of work done. Um, and, um, but no, I, to my knowledge, we've not seen specific immune signatures. Um, you know, a lot of the work has been with existing commercially available assays, and we have found that things like tumor mutational burden can change over time, um, particularly as patients get deeper into their treatment. And that's, as we know, a pretty weak surrogate for an immune signature, uh, but that's the best we have at this point. Um, Unfortunately, most patients with colorectal cancer do not benefit from immune therapy. Um, only about 3% of patients do, and that's that specifically that group of patients who are either MSI high or have an extremely high tumor mutational burden. And so we have Don Shen from our head and neck team who says, great talk. Um, in your EGFR rechallenge concept, did you see any emerging new EGFR mutations such as the T790M mutation or any other new mutations? And if there's new mutations, did you see responses when you re-challenge with EGFR antibody alone or in combination with chemo? Uh, yes, we did um, see new, uh, when, we, when we did that analysis out of the um, Gardent Health database, we did see um, EGFR ectodeme mutations that were not previously described and um, some of that work is in that uh, paper there. Um, but uh, the interesting thing is some of these EGFR ectodomain mutations are specific to one antibody. So 
the most commonly published one is, um, I think it's the S492 ectodyme mutation, which drives resistance only to cetuximab, not to panitumumab. So there may be some specific ectodyme mutations that would still allow that tumor to be sensitive to the alternate anti-EGFR therapy. So, um, so the answer is yes, we, we have seen that now. EGFR T790M is more of a kinase domain mutation, if I'm not mistaken. We rarely see it in colorectal cancer. Uh, most of our EGFR mutations are sitting up in the um, ectodomain, you know, that impact antibody binding. So I actually also have a question. So you had mentioned the Cricket study in Kronos for anti-EGFR antibody. So what are your thoughts about HER2-directed therapy? So if someone has progressed in HER2-directed therapy, do, should we take away the, the antibody or HER2-directed therapy and reintroduce it at a later time, like they saw in Kronos, or do we continue with HER2-directed therapy for our patients? Um, so in a patient that's HER2, has a HER2-positive tumor and develops primary resistance to an anti-HER2 therapy, um, you know, it's interesting because if you follow the breast cancer uh, literature, you would suggest to continue that HER2 inhibition, maybe with a different therapeutic strategy, maybe an antibody drug conjugate. Uh, and that seems, that story ap appears to be holding up, um, at least with respect to the antibody drug, uh, drug conjugate uh, DS8201 or in HER2. Um, we don't have a lot of data looking at maybe sequential use of different tyrosine kinases, anti-HER2 tyrosine kinases. Um, and at least in colon cancer. So that, that question I think has not been answer, answered adequately. Now, interestingly, in upper GI cancers, um, there does not appear to be much of a benefit in terms of continuing an anti-HER2 strategy past progression, and that's been shown uh, in a fairly robust way. So I suspect really what will answer this question is what's going on with HER2 expression, right? So if HER2 expression is sustained, that suggests that you may still have an opportunity for an anti-HER2 strategy. Um, but if um, anti-HER2, uh, or sorry, HER2 expression is lost, then I think clearly we wouldn't wanna continue an anti-HER2 strategy, give that, that tumor time away from an anti-HER2 and then potentially retest for expression later on may be the way to go um, and rechallenge at that point where that tumor regains some level of HER2 expression. But, you know, this is, um, you know, something where we'll continue to have to uh, retest our patients, both with tissue biopsies and liquid biopsies to understand what's going on with that tumor. Are you retesting people as they progress through a targeted therapy right now? Um, I, when it's safe and feasible to do that, I will strongly consider it. Um, you know, it's easy to do a liquid biopsy, you know, a commercial cell-free DNA test. But the problem with that is it doesn't tell you what's going on in the progressing lesion specifically. Um, if there is a lesion that's safe and easy to access, um, then I, I think it's reasonable to test that because we would want to go after that lesion and understand what's driving resistance. Interestingly, on Mountaineer, and I'm sure, um, you know, you've also looked at this as well, um, I'm not finding that patients are losing HER2 expression at the time of resistance. Typically, what we're seeing is emergence of genomic alterations that drive resistance, specifically KRAS, NRAS, and PIK3CA mutations seem to be the major driver of resistance to that regimen, not loss of HER2 expression. So that would suggest to me that there still is an opportunity for an antibody drug conjugate after a patient progresses on, um, say, a, a targeted therapy combo like tocatinib trastuzumab. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for giving us our grand rounds, and thank you for answering our questions. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.